Hello and welcome to day four of our journey to Christmas. Yesterday we heard about King David and how God made him a promise that the special long-awaited person would come through his line. By the time of the New Testament they've got a name for this promised person and he's called the Messiah which in Hebrew means anointed one and in Greek the word is Christ and in their culture, they anointed three kinds of people. They anointed the prophets, they anointed the priests, and they anointed the kings. And their Messiah is called the Anointed One. And so God promises that the Messiah will come through David's line. And he promises that he will have a kingdom that endures forever. There are so many things in the Old Testament that point towards this Messiah and give us clues to what it will be like. And we haven't got time to look at them all. So we're going to jump ahead and find out a little bit more about this kingdom. What do we know about this kingdom? When will this kingdom come? And it takes us to the people of God who have not obeyed him, he's given them lots of warnings and they end up in exile. And this is a story from that time in exile. In fact, it's a story that is with the king that is over the whole of Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar, he has a dream and it really disturbs him and he doesn't know what it means. And so he calls in his advisors the next day, his wise men, his advisors, and he says, I need you to interpret my dream. And they said, yes, sir, what was it? And he said, no, 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 no. You could tell me anything. Now, I need to know that this is the right interpretation. And the way I know it will be the right interpretation is if you can tell me what my dream was. A bit like me saying to you, I'm thinking of a number. What is it? It was 14,325. Did you get it right? No. <laughs> Because it's impossible. And the, the, the wise men, very carefully, because you have to be polite to the king, said, what the king has asked us to do is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods, and they don't dwell with human beings. That was their experience. God didn't dwell with human beings. And so the king says, well, you're supposed to be my advisors. I don't think much to your advice. I'm going to have you all killed. And so Daniel and his three friends get a knock at the door because they are actually included in the, the group of people that were the king's advisors, the king's wise men, and they also are about to be killed. And Daniel manages to persuade the soldier who's come to kill him to give him a little bit extra time. And then the next day he's able to go into the king and humbly say, no, king, I am not anything special, but my God is the God that reveals mysteries. And I will tell you what your dream was. And so he does. He tells him exactly what the king dreamed. He says, there was a single great statue and that statue, which was large and of extraordinary splendor, was standing in front of you and its appearance was awesome. And the head of the statue was made of fine gold and its breast and its arms were of silver, its belly and its thighs were of bronze and its legs of iron and its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. And you continued looking until a stone was cut out without hands and it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and it crushed them. And then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, the gold were crushed all at the same time and became like chaff. And the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them was found. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. That was the dream. And so then Daniel goes on to interpret the dream, to explain to Nebuchadnezzar that he and his empire, Babylon, was the head of gold. And another empire would come, that's the silver, and another one would come, the bronze, and another one would come, the iron. And then at some point, the iron and clay would be a different part of the same empire. Um, and so what is the stone? And David, uh, not David, Daniel is able to say that in those days, the days when there is an empire, fourth empire down, the one with the iron and the clay, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And that kingdom 
will not be left to another people. It will crush and put an end to all the kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. And so for the Jewish people now, along with the Messiah, the promised Messiah, they have the promise of a kingdom that will endure forever, which will um, put an end to all the other kingdoms. And so when it comes to the New Testament, to the time of Jesus's birth, these were the hopes and the expectations that the people of God had. Yesterday I mentioned disappointments because actually our disappointments come around when we had expectations that aren't met. And sometimes we don't even realise that we've got expectations until we find out that we're disappointed. And being disappointed is not wrong. Many of the people in the Old Testament experience disappointment. You go through um, the Psalms and they're saying, why? Why, God? How long? How long? What's going on? Where are you? Where are you in this, God? And um, there's a whole book in the Old Testament um, linked to disappointment and wondering why God is doing or not doing. Why am I in this situation? The book of Job. Job had many questions of God. Why is this happening to me? Why am I being treated like this? This is bad. Why? Are you even there, God? Do you even care? And at the end of the book of Job, God doesn't answer his questions. But instead, he explains that he's created the world. That he knows how it works. Job, could you even run my world for a day? No, you couldn't. So actually, Job, with all the questions that you're asking me, the question I'm asking you is, are you going to trust me? to run the world? Are you going to trust me to do things the way I want them done, to bring about my purposes through the different things that happen? Are you going to trust me? And when we see things happening, when they don't link up or they don't tie up with the expectations that we have, we can blame God and we can think that he's not doing his part when in fact the problem is with what our expectation was and in Romans Paul talks to the people there and he says it's so easy for our thinking to be um, influenced by the cultures in which we live. And he said, don't be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be renewed by the transforming of your mind. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing and perfect will. On this journey that we're taking to Christmas, there are many things that happen in the story. That are a bit difficult to understand. And actually, that's a lot like our lives. There are things that happen in our lives, in the lives of people we know, in the big world picture that we live in. We can't always understand it. And it's not what we expected and we can feel disappointed. But the question that God gave Job, which was, are you willing to trust me on this one? That's not changed. And Paul says, if we have our minds renewed by the Holy Spirit, we can start to see things his way, God's way. 
Are you willing to put your expectations to one side and to try and see life God's way? To put your trust in God's way of doing things. And when things are hard, say, I will wait for you, God, to do things your way. We're just going to close now and we're going to say the Lord's Prayer where we ask that God's will will be done in our lives and in our world. And God's kingdom will come in our lives and in our world. Let us pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.